most violent wind on Earth. A raging whirlwind with killing force, bringing destruction with devastating power to our raging planet. happen all over the world. They can occur wherever thunderstorms develop. Spain, the 31st of August, 1994. A tornado rips through the small town of Espluga da Francoli, tearing out power cables as it goes along. August 1st, 1989, the Clane Peninsula on the coast of North Wales. From the bottom of the cloud, with no rain and no lightning or thunder, a tornado suddenly drops down. Japan gets its share of severe weather. This tornado struck the city of Yokohama on the 7th of April, 1997. Later, it was strong enough to wreck a train in Yokosaka. Another big city tornado appeared suddenly near downtown Miami, Florida on the afternoon of May the 12th, 1997. Despite its terrifying appearance, this monster injured only seven people before it rolled out into Biscayne Bay. Tornadoes have power well beyond their size. If you're within a mile of one, your life could well be in danger. hunt in packs. A storm will spawn a whole family of tornadoes. And that's what happened in Arkansas on March the 1st, 1997. 20 tornadoes touched down in five hours. The town of Arkadelphia was worst hit. About a third of it was destroyed. The worst hit areas were given between 15 and 30 minutes warning to prepare for the strike. I told my sister, I said, it's getting loud, we need to get in. And we went into my mom's walk-in closet, 
And I turned around, looked, and everything was swirling around, and that's all I remember until my sister pulled me out. We were in that. We were under that in the house. I thought we were going to be dead, so we got killed. But I'm the lucky kid. America endures more tornadoes than any other country on Earth. Tornadoes strike with terrifying force and astonishing frequency, killing an average of 80 people every year. Sometimes a lot more. Stretching from West Texas to the Dakotas is Tornado Alley, 1,000 miles north to south, 600 miles east to west. This is the area struck most often. It's the heat that drives them. In spring, the warm, humid air traveling north from the Gulf of Mexico clashes with the cool, dry air moving south from Canada. Where these airstreams meet, huge supercell thunderclouds begin to build. Each supercell is a vast, breathing creature. Air is driven violently up inside the cloud, where it cools and plunges down again. These violent up and down drafts collide and twist around each other. The entire cloud becomes a titanic mass of wild, turbulent air, 12 miles high and perhaps 20 miles across. This is the creature that spawns the tornado. Oh, what a classic. More than 900 tornadoes touch down in America every year, most in Tornado Alley, making this area the tornado capital of the world. This couple, Dixie Joe and Davy Crockett, live in the center of Tornado Alley. They've had more than their fair share of bad luck. Their house has been destroyed on three separate occasions. This is our home. We're not going to move. If it blows away again, well, we'll build again. The supercell that produces tornadoes has a huge circular motion. The whole storm spins like a monstrous top. The actual tornado is much smaller and drops down from the base of the supercell cloud. This is a computer model of a supercell. The computer's been programmed with mathematical equations which predict how the storm may behave. The tornado is usually only on the ground for about 10 minutes. There is a scale of tornado power running from F1 to F5, rather like the hurricane categories. These gentle wind swirls caught on video at a Vermont picnic are dust devils weak spirals of air that are entirely different from true tornadoes. And in the superheated plains of Africa, these harmless dust devils are a daily occurrence. F1, the lowest level of a true tornado. It can pull shingles off roofs and flip over mobile homes. Winds in the funnel range from 73 to 112 miles per hour. And F2, knocks over boxcars with wind speeds of 113 to 157 miles per hour. An F3 can uproot trees with winds up to 206 miles per hour. An F4 flattens houses and hurls cars and trees hundreds of yards through the air. 
but beyond them lies the rare F5. The power of this monster is unimaginable. It can lift strong frame houses and launch them through the air. Steel reinforced concrete structures can be ripped to shreds, as they were in Gerald, Texas in May 97. Wind speeds of 318 miles per hour. The real challenge is to predict where the next tornado will strike and for the public. Moisture convergence showing up in through These are the guardians of the public at the Storm Prediction Center. They're the people who must warn of dangerous weather over the whole of the United States. As the tornado season starts, the researchers watch every storm in Tornado Alley. Any one of these storms could spawn a tornado at any time. The question is, which storms will, where, and when? The raw data they use comes from satellite images and a complex network of radar stations scattered across the country. The stream of information is endless. They use powerful computers to look for patterns that will allow them to predict the future. But some forecasters still prefer the old-fashioned ways. And done by hand since, I guess, meteorology starting, so and it gives us a better feel for what's going on in the atmosphere in close to real-time situations when we analyze the observations by hand. 84.62. That's quite reasonable for southern Minnesota. Okay, tornado warning out of Sioux Falls, eastern Brule County. Tornado was indicated by radar. May 1996, the tornado season has begun. It's late afternoon in Tornado Alley. This is the time of day when the first supercells begin to reach maturity. This slow-moving storm appears calm, even beautiful, but this is a dangerous time. 50 miles away, the Weather Service is watching the storm with its sophisticated Doppler radar equipment, looking for the signs of tornadoes. Doppler radar measures how fast an object, like a raindrop, is moving towards or away from you. In effect, it's measuring wind speed. It's pretty reasonable over here. 45 knots of shear. The extreme sensitivity of Doppler technology is beginning to transform tornado tracking from an art to a more exact science. It's starting to get a hook on. Six. It might hit that little town called Ware, yeah. maybe somewhere close to it. Yeah. This is a time of extreme uncertainty. Even Doppler radar cannot provide enough detail to predict exactly what will happen next. But the, the storm structure reveals itself better. Over the, the only answer is to have observers on the ground. Jim Leonard is one of an ever-growing handful of people who hunt tornadoes for a living. He spends each spring hunting storms in Tornado Alley and relaying back information on precisely what's happening. That storm was piddling for the longest time and all of a sudden took off. Yeah. The extraordinary skill of Jim and the other tornado chasers is being in the right place at the right time. Yeah, but it was the same kind of mushy stuff we kept watching yesterday. We kept thinking it would go into a tower and never did. Yeah, we were thinking heading down a 70 and blast west there if it looks like it's going to go. Across Tornado Alley, a series of thunderstorms are forming. One begins to rotate. It's 4 p.m. At the Storm Prediction Center, the radar screens and satellite images are not looking good. I still think it's going to be somewhere in the Watertown area. They will soon have to issue a series of general watches. These are advisories to be prepared in certain areas across the country. 
It means there's a strong risk of severe thunderstorms developing over the next two or three hours. Hi, Buffalo. This is Mike Vesher from the Storm Prediction Center. Yeah, how you doing, Mike? Good. We're going to have to tack on uh, south of the current watch, I believe, based on what I'm seeing developing in Ontario County. Yeah, it looks like it's just all, yeah. all developing in the south. But These are the kinds of storms that could generate tornadoes, but it's still too early to issue a specific tornado watch. Severe thunderstorm watch number 393. We'll start it at 0Z and end it at 4Z. Be 30 miles either side of the line. By late afternoon, numerous thunderstorms are powering up over Tornado Alley, too. Rich Thompson is an old friend of Jim Leonard, who's out there on the plains. Rich calls Jim. Hello. Hey, Jim, this is Rich. Hey, Rich. Well, I was curious if you've seen any indication of rotation. Yeah, but there was three storms along this bunch here. Yeah, they just look tired right now. Okay, it looks kind of messy on radar right now, and I'd be prepared to have an outfall boundary maybe approaching you from the northwest in the next 45 minutes or so. Oh, really? Chance that it could turn into a yeah. minus storms. All right, thanks a lot. All right, take it easy. These are Doppler radar scanners mounted on trucks. The Dopplers on wheels can nearly always get closer to tornadoes than fixed radars. But in 1996, the research team hoped to go one better. Their goal? To send an instrument package and camera right into the heart of a tornado using a remote-controlled helicopter. If they succeed, they will make history by getting a view from inside the funnel itself for the very first time. <laughs> the helicopter carries a camera, a pressure sensor, and a thermometer that Frank Gallagher put together. Jeff Bell piloted it from the ground. This year, the team of scientists was led by Josh Werman. The helicopter carried a tiny radio transmitter with a range of 14 miles that would guide them to the wreckage wherever the tornado dumped it. Early May, the tornado season is on. The Doppler on wheels heads for Tornado Alley. The tornado is hunted like a dangerous animal. The next six weeks are the scientists' best opportunity to catch their prize. Hey, this is Christine from the weather office in Amarillo. And uh, we've just issued a tornado warning for Deaf Smith County. And the warning is in effect until 6 o'clock. The National Weather Service in Amarillo has issued a tornado warning effective until 6 p.m. for the people in Dallum County. At 5.13 p.m., National Weather Service Doppler radar indicated a severe thunderstorm capable of producing a tornado developing over southwest Dallas County. This is a dangerous storm situation. Do not run outside to find the tornado. Seek shelter immediately. Once a tornado is forecast, they still have to get the warning to the people in danger in time for them to get to safety. And here, the broadcasters are the key. Gary England is the chief meteorologist for KWTV in Oklahoma City. Okay, on the uh, risk area, we continue along the line from Ponca City to Weatherford to Lawton to the west of that, about out to the border. We'll continue with a moderate risk of severe thunderstorms. That could be some large hail and high, high, strong, damaging winds, that type of thing. The rest of the state, uh, what we would call a slight risk. <laughs> I started here in 72, and uh, the average warning time then was about minus one minute. I could only warn you because it blew Henry's house away down the street. So it's come all the way to giving some time, giving a 20-minute or a 30-minute warning on a large tornado. So it's improved dramatically. You don't get them all. You still miss some, but you get the big ones. Understand tornadoes better. Scientists must strive to measure what's happening inside the funnel itself. They must get their instruments and themselves close enough to the vortex to get more and better data.
In 1994 and 95, the National Severe Storms Laboratory deployed a fleet of 13 research vehicles in the struggle to learn what happens inside a tornado. Their main weapon was the Doppler radar on wheels. In 1994, even with 75 scientists, 13 vehicles and two research planes, they got almost nothing at all. For the most of the 1995 season, their bad luck continued. As the 1995 season wore on, they came close to several large tornadoes, but not close enough. They weren't able to get a good close radar shot of a funnel. Then, right near the end of that season, their luck improved. Dimmit, Texas, the 2nd of June. Success, finally. For the very first time, using the Doppler on wheels, scientists had real data from inside a tornado. eye of the tornado, uh, which probably is also clear visually. If you were inside that tornado, you could probably probably look like being inside a hurricane. Um, there's very little debris, very little rain. Um, surrounding that is this red region, which is sliced through a cone of debris that's being lifted by the tornado. And this consists of you know, chickens, cows, telephone poles, whatever's been lifted up um, from the farmland. You notice that there's a very strong downdraft perhaps 30 meters per second in the center of the storm. And that was quite exciting and um, not necessarily expected. The winds in this tornado were about 70 meters per second, um, so extremely fast. It lofted cars about 200 meters, very damaging tornado. They thought Dimmit was big, but six days later on the 8th of June, they met something even bigger. The town is Pampa, Texas. This is a tornado warning. There is a tornado in the Pampa area on the west side. All of the Pampa area should be taking cover at this time. This is a block pressure. It was one of the most destructive tornadoes of the year. Sheriff Randy Stubblefield witnessed and filmed the entire event from his car. I turned on Highway 60 at this intersection. And as I turned onto the highway, I had my siren going and I reached down at that point in time and put my camera up on the dash. At this point in time, I could see the tornado straight ahead of us, and it had not yet reached the ground. At first, it was categorized as an F3, but later, upgraded to F4. Hey, it's just right now, Crawl Products headed in towards Pampa. At Crawl Products, just hit it. I decided that my best point of, uh, of uh, observing the tornado is going to be past these trees in this house right here. I'm right here with them, 100 yards from it, Debbie. So I pulled out into the highway, well, the highway right out in here. Now, we've got all kinds of coming down the floor there. You can actually, in the video, see, see the railroad crossing here. But the taller buildings over there is uh, what's, what's the uh, first part of the city that it hit. around this giant were spinning at over 200 miles per hour. This is probably the clearest evidence of a tornado's power ever caught on camera. Amongst the flying debris, you can see a pickup truck flicked into the air as casually as a pebble. Oh, it's happening! And this is what automobiles look like after they've had a tornado encounter. All of these were destroyed on that summer afternoon. They belonged to Ted Quillen. 
This was a late model Chevrolet self-contained motorhome in perfect condition with 13,000 miles on it before the storm and as you can see afterwards. A Jeep, about 15 years old, had 25,000 miles on it, was in perfect condition. Just seconds before the storm, I drove it to the building. Late model Chrysler with 30,000 miles on it, changed all over 1,000 miles, perfect condition before the storm. This is the reason they were all perfect condition. I drove up there where I went, had 150,000 miles on it. Ted not only lost his vehicles, he also lost his house, his business, and one of his dogs. When I first seen the large tornado, it was about a mile over near the Emerald Highway. It was going straight north. Looks like he's going to miss it. We got to, just inside that gray building, it made a 45 degree turn, so straight across this property. I entered here and sat down and watched with holding the door. I pulled it on shut and entered the cellar. Uh, it was loud, I could probably hear it from five or six hundred yards. Suddenly, in all this noise and debris, I heard in my mind the voice said, Go to the bottom and go left. I done exactly that. The door flew open. My dog ran up the bottom and as she went, I looked up and seen right inside the middle of the vortex. We have power lines that are down and it just went through it. It continues to be on the ground. Debris flying everywhere. Everybody will remain under cover. But the Pampa tornado was not the end of it. That Thursday afternoon produced a whole string of tornadoes. Tornado number two is right there. That day, 21, maybe more, violently struck the countryside around Pampa. Even the total number is not certain. What is certain is that some were huge. There were at least three storm chasing teams in the area, and they recorded much of the drama on video. Jim Leonard was out chasing with his friend Rich Thompson from the Storm Prediction Center. I say about uh, two to three miles, maybe a little closer. In the second vehicle was Mike Morgan, a professional TV meteorologist in Oklahoma City. He started his chasing career when he was only 10 years old. Tim Marshall came across dramatic evidence of tornado power. The winds had ripped away the surface of the road. See it right there? Wow. Concrete has been scoured. Time is 7.04. Much of this area is open farmland. The homesteads are well spread out. But with this number of tornadoes, inevitably some houses were hit. The Hogan family did not have a storm cellar. They took shelter in two closets in the center of the house. Two hid in one, three in the other. There, in the terror of total darkness and thunderous noise, they sat the tornado out. For the seven minutes the tornado took to rage over them, Rob Hogan knelt and prayed. His father, Chuck, stood behind him in the tumultuous darkness. First thing I heard was when the front porch exploded. And then, and the next, the next heartbeat, the front door exploded. It's really hard to breathe. I reached, of course, the door was shut, and I reached out here, and there was a big bow in the door, and I could feel it. And I thought, uh, the house got to go just, just any minute, it can't take any more of this. The Hogan's were lucky. Maybe it wasn't a direct hit. It's not clear how they and their house survived at all. 
the tornado moved on to other victims. Let me get a thing of you. 20 miles from the Hogan's lived the Crockett's. This was the day that Davy Crockett's house was destroyed for the third time. All right. Well, the tornado hit about 6.30 in the afternoon. It came right across that hill yonder. And when it got out into the green, just about a quarter mile from here, I called 911. Went into the cellar and shut the door and the house just blew away. Well, a lot of people say it's like a freight train, but it wasn't to me, it'd be like a big river. Pull the house down, we knew the house was gone. And the first thing we asked, that I asked the fire department, I said, what's left? And uh, the man on the fire department said, David, there's nothing left, he said, it's all gone. Out in the fields, Davy Crockett's livestock suffered the full force of the tornado. Davy still has four animals that were badly hurt in that awful event. In all, the Crockett's lost 97 head of cattle, five horses, and three mules. Debris flying through the air, tin, lumber, Post wire, would break their legs, break their backs, go plumb through them, um, take their cow. We even had some of their heads cut off. Nineteen ninety six was a year for a new approach for the scientists. They were trying guerrilla tactics. They had just two vehicles instead of the 13 they deployed in 95. Just a Doppler radar on wheels and a backup car. They hoped the maneuverability of this small team would get them to the right place more often. They also had with them the radio controlled helicopter with its instrument and camera package. They hoped to fly straight into a tornado's heart and record the very first pictures of what's inside. It's early afternoon. Josh Werman has a dilemma. It will be hours before any tornadoes develop today. But he must make a decision now about where to look for them. Well, basically we're trying to decide whether to go northwest towards Colorado, where not much is happening now, but there's a potential for some supercell storms, which, are, which if they form, would be likely to be tornadic. Um, or we could try to head southeast to where there's already convection starting to occur but it might not be tornadic. And unfortunately, we're right in between, and we're about two or three hours from either, so we really, at this point, have to make a decision to go that way or that way. Either way, the team must drive several hundred miles, a normal day in the life of a tornado hunter. So if it was in my own car, I'd probably go to the Texas Canyon hour because you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. Yeah. Finish here in a cold place. <laughs> Josh decides to head for Liberal, Kansas. He won't know for several hours whether he's made the right call. You can easily drive 600 miles in a day of storm chasing and most searches come up empty. But this one is looking better and better as the air heats up in the late afternoon. Back in Oklahoma City, Gary England is watching the radar screens. We have a uh, tornado watch northwest, uh, and we have a severe thunderstorm watch in effect for about the western one half of the state. There's been no severe weather reported in Oklahoma, but they uh, could easily be some very strong damage and winds, some large hail. And you see the storms moving, uh, some of them just about moving northwest of Alva. Josh and his team made the right call, but they're still a long way from success. The storm fronts can stretch for 100 miles and move at 20 miles an hour. Josh hopes that scanning the clouds will at least give him some indication of where and when a tornado might develop. 
he needs to get within a mile of the exact spot where a tornado may just possibly touch down in the next hour. Quick check, uh, let's go top 9000 XL movie mode. Thunderstorms uh, that point on the line moving east about 35. That's going a little bit closer here, western Oklahoma, Benson, up towards Sentinel, and then on northward up to Alva, moving toward the Cherokee area. And we'll do a quick check on a tornado earlier. This was uh, just north of Liberal, Kansas today. Several of our people were on that particular storm, and fortunately out in an open area. So if there was here TV9, we'll keep you advised. Josh Werman and the mobile Doppler moved to the southwestern corner of the storm. For tornado chaser Jim Leonard, the challenge is the same, to get as close to ground zero as he safely can. The National Weather Service in Amarillo has a two-day tornado watch for all of the Texas panhandle. Effectiveness the warning goes out on shortwave radio, by computer via satellite, by weather service alert radio, and as a last measure, by direct phone calls. Radio and TV stations pick it up and pass it on. The Doppler team pause again to check their direction. They're now beneath the edges of a fully developed tornadic supercell. Even with two hours of daylight remaining, it's already like night. But to catch a tornado, they must get even closer. I mean, I don't know, maybe something's going to develop there. That would be perfect. I mean, so. oh, yeah. <laughs> Big hailstones could destroy the radar dish. So Josh must find a safe path into the storm's heart. It's time for one last trial of the radio-controlled helicopter under storm conditions. Again, it works perfectly. It copes easily with the wind. They check out the radio direction finder. It works too. These beeps will lead them to the remains of the helicopter and its instruments if they do fly it into the twister. Suddenly, a wedge of slowly rotating cloud, shaped like the base of a pyramid, descends. This is called a wall cloud. It's the final sign a tornado could form in minutes. This would be the time for most people to run for their lives. But for the Doppler research team, it's time to start recording their data. Jim Leonard is also closing in. A tornado is developing in front of them. Its violence is hidden behind a veil of whirling dust. Inside it will be winds well over 100 miles per hour. Now would be the time for the scientists to launch the helicopter. They're close enough to aim accurately, but there is another big problem. Its blades would be instantly shattered by the falling hail. This proved to be the helicopter's last chance of the season. They never did get it into a tornado. As dust is sucked up, the shape of the funnel becomes easier to see. Kansas was fortunate this day. The tornado touched down miles from any populated area and faded after just a few minutes with no harm done. Without the spotters, TV stations could well have missed it. Yep. Okay, tell me your story. Yeah, we were about, uh, just about in its circulation when it started. It started up just on my left, and I had to floor to get in front of it. Then I 
put in the rear view mirror. The whole rear view mirror was covered with, uh, you know, covered by debris. Uh, great. How long did it last? Uh, I think it lasted about 10, maybe 10 or more minutes. It was moving very slowly. We had almost, you know, no movement at all for a while. You know, we're getting hit like baseball hail at the time. Saturday night, a week later, 9 p.m. in the evening. Right now, tornado on the ground north of Sims. Okay, thanks a bunch. Bye-bye. Tornado north of Sims in uh, Deaf Smith County. Uh, current information says this cell is going to pass just to the west of the Hereford vicinity. Any spotters in that area that can relay any information, your information would be appreciated. This is WS5R, National Weather Service, Emerald. truck has also spotted the Sims tornado. Radar can see perfectly well in the dark, so they get a good recording of the start of the tornado. It shows a well-developed hook. Sunday morning daylight showed the true reality. The tornado's visit was brief but devastating. It was an F2, only on the ground for 12 minutes, and in that time, it traveled three miles. Fortunately, no one was injured, but it leveled two houses, damaged two more, and destroyed a barn. Every year, tornadoes take their toll. Between April and July of 1996, 722 tornadoes were officially recorded. That year, tornadoes caused 200 serious injuries and 24 deaths. And that was a quiet year. Most seasons, tornadoes kill more. Since the 1960s, on average, 82 people have died each season. Back in the 50s, tornadoes killed many more, 200 to 300 people each year. But now the warnings are better. People are better prepared. And buildings are designed for better protection. Of those killed by tornadoes, 50% are attributed to mobile homes. His wife left minutes before the storm crushed their house. If 1996 was an easy year for tornado deaths, the 97 started off in the worst possible way. Arkansas, March the 1st, 1997. 20 tornadoes touched down in just five hours. 26 people were killed. Just one day in 97, it topped the previous year's total. underground storm cellars were safe. There used to be a house on this concrete slab. 
One woman had a miraculous escape in her bathtub. Lay down on my right side in the bathtub, put the blanket over me, and sat there hoping it would go by. But it didn't go by. Her house was ripped off its foundations, and she went flying through the air. Moving through the air. And uh, then all of a sudden, I realized I was laying on the ground, just being pelted with debris, things flying through the air, beating on my body. Astonishingly, she was only bruised. But the final toll in Gerald was 27 deaths. Each year, we're better able to predict these massive destroyers and give people more time to prepare and survive. There is no escape from the terror they bring. Tornadoes will continue to cut scars on the land and on the minds of so many on our raging planet.